you know, close our eyes and say that, you know, everything is fine and nothing will happen. Uh, Allah better karega. So that's the, that's one aspect. The second aspect, if you look at the, the quality of water, which is available, I mean, Pakistan is signatory to SDGs. We want to increase the number to, you know, where people have access to safe drinking water to, you know, 96% sanitation to, I don't know, 86%. But look at the figures. I mean, even if you say that, uh, you know, 89% of the people in Pakistan have access to safe drinking water. <laughs> uh, if you look at the contamination in that safe drinking water, you know, it's just huge. Let's, let's not forget the arsenic, the high levels of arsenic. Look at the, the numbers of, uh, you know, it's hardly 1% of the wastewater that we, uh, that we treat. So all sewage, all industrial affluent is contaminating our water body. And that's the reason when we, you know, as WWF, we started Pakistan Waters at Risk campaign, that we need to protect our, you know, water bodies. We need to address the issue, uh, you know, at, and, and try to find the root causes and improve and protect that. Because if we are ignoring one sector, we are increasing the burden of another sector. Uh, look at the number of patients who are hospitalized or who get sick just because of waterborne diseases. Let's not talk about, you know, uh, the infectious diseases and the pandemic, you know, which we are facing. But look at the infant mortality rate. So all those figures tell us that if you are not protecting your water uh, uh, sources, then you are exposing your community to waterborne diseases. Uh, and then you are losing productivity hours, you are increasing your, uh, uh, you know, health burden. And this has direct links to GDP. Uh, it, there, are demo, there are examples, proven examples, that once, you know, there's a water, uh, in a water stress country, how this impacts uh, the GDP. Lastly, uh, you know, um, before, uh, uh, I'll take the liberty and slightly uh, disagree with one of the points mentioned by Lagari Saab when he said that we need to improve our water efficiency. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't have to improve our water efficiency, but my point is we have to improve our water productivity. I mean, it doesn't matter if you grow a high delta crop and you improve the water efficiency, the burden will still be there, the impact will still be there. We have to really see the, you know, and maybe uh, take some harsh, tough decisions the way we are managing and governing our uh, water resources. Uh, so water efficiency going for, you know, but the, the crops that we are producing, uh, the industry sectors which are using water, the way, and then that also includes the water pricing, which is uh, still uh, unfortunately a, a very sensitive topic to be discussed, you know, in our case. But I'll, I'll stop here. But uh, I think with the, with the point that it's a, it, it, needs a, it needs a holistic uh, approach, a holistic action. Thank you. Thank you. And I totally agree with you. I mean, wastewater treatment is one of the areas that I have expertise in. And there's absolutely no appetite for even discussion on wastewater treatment when you go to certain platforms. People don't even mention it. So sometimes, like, slightly, you have to bring in uh, the aspect that how on the one hand, there's, there's so much discussion about water conservation. And on the other, you're only treating less than 2% of the wastewater and, and therefore contaminating all the freshwater resources that we have in this country. Um, so thank you so much for summarizing it so well. I'll now go to, towards um, Simi Ma'am and, and ask her that, of course, if, if you look at the sustainable development goals um, in general, you will see that water lies at the heart of all of them. You know, whether it's life below water, whether it's water and sanitation um, and, and many other things, right? Uh, access to safe drinking water, etc. So because water takes the center stage and because it is directly related to uh, the livelihood of people, how do you think has this pr precious commodity impacted the livelihood of people in, in Pakistan um, over, over this time? Thank you, Forjia. Well, you know, we are an agricultural country. And uh, so there is an absolutely direct sacred link between land, water, and people. And uh, unfortunately, instead of really building this agriculture base, 
we have been you know cutting away at it we have tried our best to destroy it if you if you want if you want me to speak really frankly how how much how much money how much effort how much thinking is going into our agricultural center uh, sectors and i say that you know pakistan's economy is a water economy and if we recognize it's a water economy our agriculture base will keep on tottering if we don't take care of our water resources so my question here to everyone to all of us to myself is what, what are we doing about the integrity of water systems in pakistan the water cycle the indus basin yes it's a it's a um, provincial subject and then people are telling us well now it's been devolved well it's always been devolved i mean they have the the water the irrigation water has always been taken care of by provinces it's nothing new it's not related to 18th amendment and you know the drink we are losing we lost you for a little bit there we seem we pretend that there are no water issues outside the irrigation system what about balochistan and thar and the potohar and our mountain areas and our coastal zones who's responsible for the integrity of water what are there and we hardly get that into our discourse even even the water policy for which we waited 20 years that doesn't address these issues it keeps talking about more challenges we know what the challenges are now is the time to talk about solutions what is it that we have got to do and if you want to see some of the things that we we have to do i'll talk a little bit about that first of all we have got to get water out of what uh, i think we can call the military industrial complex if you want to look at water holistically okay whether it is the us army corps taking care of all the dams and the water systems in us whether it is our own wabda now run by the military or so it seems i may be wrong okay if we look we we'll, we we'll look at irsa we look at the plethora of institutions that are in pakistan looking at how are they linking this to our productivity to agriculture to industry who's do economy of water or yeah you mentioned waste water people are talking about the entire cycle from waste to sweet water to waste who's doing that we don't even hear those terms uh, they're not reflected in our policy documents so if you ask me how do we move forward see we we have to understand that the solutions lie yes water efficiency yes water productivity yes circular economy of water but we can't do that if we only look at water or or at the most as technological solutions because at least we've considered that thank god we didn't even want to look that way and i'm i'm really delighted with what abu bakar and his team do i follow that quite a lot very closely and then we say very easily well it's about management and governance because it's all about politics so our discourse is uh, that's what the donors also like to do that's what they like to push it is so much easier to talk about management and governance that's what young students are doing everyone is writing their thesis on these topics what about the science of water the arts of water the sociology psychology of water we are looking at those the water science people who will look at hydrology the you know, geographers and geologists the water specialists the chemists who look at not just the the bigness of water but also the smallness of water who is getting out the pollutants okay where is the the chemistry that uh, we need to look at all of those things need to be developed in a much greater way if we talk of solutions and then what do we do about corporatization of water nestle they are a host but there is a lot wrong with the way the corporate sector works in the in, in water okay and you know there are terms like just water efficiency and just focusing on that you know it it hides it hides a lot of what is what is wrong in the way we are managing water where is the equality where is the access why don't doesn't everybody have drinking water on this planet why are we bent on destroying our water resources where are the sane voices for that and the few sane voices that are there you know are are being suppressed and uh, can we really expect the military industrial complex within a capitalist society no capitalist global system to really deliver 
on what some of the scientists are talking about. People like Vandana Shiva, she's been calling for the depatenting of food resources of the world for decades. I couldn't even invite her to Pakistan. I tried to get her here. There's no way a visa would ever be granted because she's taken on the might of the world corporate sectors. That is the issue. And then, of course, people like young people like Rita Thunberg, who has been calling for recognizing the climate emergency and acting now. Okay, look at the detractors. Then when we talk about, uh, uh, we look at IPCC, and IPCC had to fight to be heard with 2,000 plus highly eminent scientists. Their voice is still not as strong as it should be. And we don't even have anything like IPCC in the water sector. So globally, this is one of my, um, I don't want to use the word crusade, one of, one of my big efforts globally is to get to work on the science order so that when we speak about water issues in Pakistan, we keep coming back to bad governance and politics. Why? Because there are other things we should be doing in the water sector that we are not. And we need to do much more of that. The kind of work that uh, WWF does there, we have to do it multiplied by a hundred times or a thousand times what HR Foundation can do, what LUMS can do, what so many of our universities can do. So I, I really want to use this platform to call for, for building the science base of water in our universities. And that should be placed within the thinking of degrowth, economic degrowth. We, we can't survive what is happening to us unless we change the way we do economics. And so we have to move first to zero growth and then to degrowth and then to think about what water means within that for Pakistan. And we have to stop relying on other sources. Where is the annual report on water that you, me, and all of us should be producing in Pakistan? We're not doing that. Why not? Okay, and we, we have to get young students in our universities to take on the difficult subjects of water. For example, when was the last time we actually measured to see how many million acre feet of water we get? How do we get it? Where does it come from? Which are the measurement points? This 144, I've been hearing this, you know, all my professional life. And then we say 114 million acre feet, 17 if we include a few civil canals. A lot has happened since then. That, where's that reflected? Why have we not corrected these figures? I know by talking to my friends in Issa that now it's not even 94 or 96 per year that we get. It's not even 114. Then there is the whole groundwater debate. We hardly talk about that. You know, Punjab has 50 million acre feet of sweet groundwater, which others do not. And, you know, we have just abandoned our people who, who lie in, uh, in the non- uh, in this area. So what are some of the things? There are some solutions. We need to fix what every human being in Pakistan needs. And the government has to build on a policy to supply that need to every human being, regardless of where they live. It has to go down you know, to provinces, from provinces to districts, and they have to supply. If you're saying more and more uh, people are coming into cities, where is the water coming from? Maybe each person who moves from wherever needs to bring their water entitlement with them which should be supplied as part of uh, the, the right of that province on Pakistan's total water resources. So these are some of the new and different ways that uh, we need to think. A little later, I'll talk about uh, gender dimensions, but I'll stop here now. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for setting the tone so high uh, from, from where we started. Uh, but I, I do agree with, with all the things and most of the things that, that you said. Um, but just to steer the conversation forward, I will now go towards Dr. Bashir. Um, and I want to relate this to where I am from. Although uh, Hamad sir kind of mentioned how climate change impacts uh, water and climate change often manifests itself in, in the way water acts in the, in the globe. So uh, because, for example, I'm from the north, I've in my lifetime seen the amount of glops increase. I've seen the villages that live right below um, certain glaciers get impacted, evacuate their villages. Um, and you know, so much has happened that did not used to happen in my grandparents' time or my parents' time. And the frequency has increased so much. So I think people would be fool, like it, it would be very stupid of people to not accept that climate change is happening and it is impacting people directly, not just in the mountainous areas, but then downstream, how would that impact the water availability 
and uh, the sustainability of water availability in the Indus water basin. So there's a lot that climate change is doing to water in Pakistan. And of course, it makes us one of the most vulnerable countries. But uh, would you like to elaborate from the research side, from, from the institution that you had? Um, how, how would you like to educate the audience who's sitting with us today on this? Uh, uh, thank you. Uh... Uh, Ms. Fazia, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Yeah, yes, uh, I think well said. Uh, regarding uh, uh, Pakistan vulnerability due to climate change, uh, as uh, uh, said by uh, Dr. Hamad, so Pakistan is most vulnerable and fifth or uh, seventh uh, vulnerable country. And uh, its uh, vulnerability in the water sector uh, even goes very high as uh, our most of water sources come from uh, 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 fresh water, which is the snow and glacier, and uh, uh, these sectors are most vulnerable uh, due to climate change. Uh, yes, as you said, you you are from that area, and uh, uh, I mean a lot of studies. Uh, uh, I mean most of the studies they 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 do uh, um, focusing on uh, climate change impact on the fresh water sources no, as well as glacier, especially in this region, HKH region and in the upper Indus basin. So uh, I, I, I mean, uh, we were collecting data uh, all over Pakistan and especially when uh, we were uh, interacting with people in uh, uh, South area, which is the last town in uh, Punjab. So uh, uh, there was a very, uh, I mean, interesting uh, elaboration made by the local people. They said they, uh, uh, indicator uh, they used to uh, skiing uh, uh, in the Hunza River uh, during uh, um, winter time as well as uh, in the spring time. Um, but nowadays, uh, I mean, uh, uh, ten to fifteen or twenty years before, but uh, now they uh, don't uh, see this kind of events because uh, there's no uh, snow cover uh, uh, on the uh, in the river. So, uh, as well as they say, they, uh, I mean, they, they have very special dresses, uh, chugas kind of uh, very warm dresses, but uh, uh, only uh, uh, customonial dresses. Uh, they don't need, even need to wear in the winter because of uh, warming in those areas. As well as, you uh, know, there are a lot of, uh, Mm, fridges as well as uh, air cones are introduced in those areas. So this is kind of a uh, ground situation uh, described by the local uh, residents over there. Yes, uh, due to climate change causing uh, in terms of if we see the hydrology, so uh, reduce uh, inflows resulting more intensified, frequent erratic hydrological extreme in terms of uh, floods and droughts. And uh, whereas, uh, so um, in terms of, uh, we have a low adaptation capacity in terms of financial constraints, knowledge, as well as the te uh, technological gaps of the uh, institution, uh, so some issues. So uh, uh, I, we were uh, in a very international as well as regional studies under our project highway and uh, there, uh, uh, and with the studies, we found that as uh, nowadays, uh, IPCC, as well as many other institutions are talking about uh, 1.5 and 2 degree. If we in future restrict uh, the global temperature by these, but uh, uh, 1.5 and 2 degrees would be a uh, highly impact uh, on our glacier sources as well as water sources. So 1.5 degree, uh, under this uh, scenario, uh, with the modeling approach, we found that uh, uh, about 36% uh, of the glacier volume we will lose by the end of this century if 1.5 degree, uh, uh, we can uh, restrict the temperature 1.5 degree. But uh, if a uh, two degree global warming scenario implies a regional warming of around, so uh, in the HKH, and especially in upper Indus basin, about 40, 50% of the ice volume will lose. And then it's uh, other implication like snow cover areas and the snow volume will decrease and snow line elevation will rise. Snow melt induced runoff peaks uh, will be stronger and occur, uh, earlier in the year. 
and like those uh, many other uh, consequences like uh, the uh, as uh, uh, more frequent uh, uh, drops uh, and uh, then it's uh, it's also and uh, then uh, uh, in terms of what availability so uh, average river flows will increase by the end of uh, this century uh, in the upper Andes basin about 50 percent we will increase due to the uh, enhanced glacier melting uh, afterward uh, uh, there will be a decline and uh, in terms of uh, floods so more intense as well as frequent flood we will may uh, 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 get so uh, uh, in terms uh, uh, and due to this climate change and uh, its uh, impact on uh, uh, our water supplies, water sources availability. So we, we need to adjust and align our water management uh, with the climate change as uh, uh, we may get uh, low snow, low, uh, as well as uh, more rain, more rain for variability, more intense uh, uh, and um, amplified extremes. And accordingly, we need to enhance our uh, water management, our uh, storage capacity, as well as uh, our uh, institute situ water harvesting. So this is uh, the message in terms of water management and value of water. And uh, uh, our policy should be aligning, uh, uh, aligned with this uh, climate change uh, occurrence. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much. So I think I will now go towards Dr. Mubakar. There were highlights in the discussion about uh, bringing that industry academia linkage, giving academia the liberty to do more, to tell the policymakers more. Um, Dr. Hovaker has been doing some research in the technology side. And of course, we spoke about agriculture and irrigation efficiency. Um, so maybe he'll speak about that. But I also want him to highlight um, you know, whether this, this, the bringing these kind of gadgets outside is possible, given how limited the funding is for academia. And have you been able to survive this far? And what are your dreams? for technology efficiency in agriculture and irrigation for, for the future. Uh, thank you, Fazia. So I, I will come back to you, maybe, maybe a question about uh, scaling up of these technologies just a little bit later, but I wanted to say one thing that probably has not been said uh, in many of these forums before. And uh, this is the, uh, the development of the human resource, the required talent that needs to go into this sector in order to solve this problem. Now you introduce me as some high-flying roboticist who is looking into this agricultural problems as if these are two words and these are really two words. I mean, uh, look at my position. I am uh, chairing the de uh, a department of 20 plus faculty, the most talent packed uh, uh, academic unit in the country. I mean, every year my students go to MIT, literally the top student, it ends up being a graduate student at the top institute in the world. My challenge really is twofold is on the one hand, I'm looking at these small farmers, these marginalized communities, the women that we are talking about, the downstream, even the, uh, the ecological flows and the, <laughs> and the biodiversity. But on the, on the other hand, look at where I need to put my head on in bringing all this, this, uh, these available resources and these opportunities to these problems. And I think that seems to be the bigger challenge. Uh, uh, Nagari Sahib talked about uh, technology, like uh, what, whatever is happening in the world is probably not ready for us to be uh, taken up in, uh, by our farmers, and that's absolutely correct. But at the same time, our talent, uh, uh, the, the most talented people in this country, to bring them to the table and to be able to solve these problems, that is the, the bigger challenge uh, in, in, in my mind. So we are taking small steps in that direction. I, I, I have talked about various things that we have done as far as the various technologies are concerned, but I would also like to share that we are also doing now quite a bit in the classrooms. Uh, one experience that I would like to share is that this year, uh, we have taught a course to our freshman students. Uh, the first year university students, a required course for all our science and engineering ma uh, uh, majors on intelligent sustainable systems, where we are actually taking them to the field, uh, an on-campus field where we are growing wheat showing them how agriculture is done. And then these are the various technologies that can, that can help you. And they actually think about them, uh, these problems using these um, very uh, sort of sophisticated tools, but sort of bringing them to the earth and, and sort of connecting them to these, these, these real problems on ground. So my submission would be to all of the people who are, who are here in this panel and who are listening to me to kindly help us bridge this gap. Because on, on the one hand, we have this inequality 
uh, between the advanced world, the, 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 the Western world, as well as within Pakistan, where people are attracted towards this new future in which there is going to be artificial intelligence and there is this all, all this development which is going on. But on the other hand, the problems of the, of the marginalized, of the small farmers and so on and so forth, and how we can do that, whether it is using technology, high tech or low tech, uh, I mean, that seems to be the real challenge to me. Now, coming back to your, actu uh, to, 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 to your question about how can we, uh, what, what are we able to get attention for uh, developing these technologies or support from the industry and, 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 uh, and, and the government agencies? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that to me doesn't seem to be the problem. Once again, the problem that seems to me is really the human resource. Who is going to take up these technologies and now going to scale up? I mean, uh, some groups may do it in, in universities. There are uh, exciting startups which are being, uh, which are coming up all over the country, springing uh, from these uh, young people who are going into these areas. But how to take these technologies now to, uh, to the thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of farmers and end users, that is going to be the real challenge. So there are some positives on these uh, developments where these ideas are, are, are emerging, but also some, um, uh, some, 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 some very fundamental challenges as well. Let me just quote one particular problem. So for example, our agricultural uh, engineering industry. Now, whatever innovation that you try to do regarding whether it is water efficiency or sustainable agriculture, I mean, you have to make some machines, you have to make some, uh, some standard implements and, and, and make them available to, uh, to the farmers and end users. Uh, believe me, when we have looked at it, there is no standardization in our agricultural uh, engineering industry. I mean, that, that it is as basic a problem as that. Uh, we have just launched uh, in the country maybe five or six models of these SUVs last year. I mean, that is what is going on in the auto sector. But look at our agricultural engineering industry, and we call ourselves an agricultural country. So once again, that is the bridge that we, uh, that we need to make between these two worlds, as I see. On the one hand, our, uh, whatever is going on in our cities, in our, um, uh, in our posh areas, uh, at lums, at <laughs> in, in the DHAs, and, 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 the, and the world, which is very far away. Um, so I will stop here, uh, 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 Fazia, but uh, let me just sort of emphasize this, that this is no longer uh, an issue of producing the right technology anymore. We have shown it. Uh, we have produced many innovations, as many of you know, and there is no point in sort of repeating on that. Many of these things are being scaled up, but really the challenge that I, that I see is that taking it even outside in the field and doing it at a few thousand or a few hundred sites, that's not going to be enough. How, how can we create that human resource that is going to take this up and scale it really all, all over. Right. Yes, very, very, very true, uh, Dr. Obakar. And I think what is also important is the fact that when we develop these technologies, do we actually make farmers or the actual consumer a part of the envisioning of making those products? And I think that would be most important of, you know, after you take this technology to them, would they be happy, so happy to see it that they would be happy to invest in it with the little that they have. So I think bringing them into the conversation would, would make the technology take over if it's not coming from the government or if it's not coming from you know, the investment and policy side. Uh, but um, I'll now go back to uh, Mr. Hamad and, and ask him, WWF has a huge legacy of, of projects. Uh, there's so much that you've done. There's so much that you're doing. And you know, of course, it's, it's not all gray. I'm sure that there's a lot has been achieved and a lot of good work has been done. Mm -hmm. So would, would you like to explain or highlight some of those so that the audience also knows what's, what good has been happening in, in the water and valuing water sector? Okay, uh, so if you look at our, you know, approach in general, we work in uh, primarily two fronts. Uh, the first one is the policy uh, work where we do a lot of uh, you know, advocacy and lobbying. The second is uh, promoting uh, better management practices in the field. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, this issue is so complex uh, that honestly, water is everybody's business. It's not the, for, the, you know, uh, for one sector, for one community, or for one group. Uh, and that's the challenge that we picked up. If you look at the, let me, let me come straight to the, the, the field interventions that we have implemented or, you know, uh, uh, 
we implemented, you know, or we plan to implement. Uh, so we all know that agriculture is the, the major water user. So we have, a, as part of our sustainable agriculture program, we are working with more than 250,000 farmers on sustainable agronomic practices. And then we link them to, uh, you know, to different, uh, to different international brands and retailers so that their produce, which is produced in an environmentally friendly manner, is picked by, uh, used by, consumed by, uh, you know, these uh, business partners. Uh, and those uh, practices led to the foundation of a global standard for cotton, which is called Better Cotton Initiative. The first Better Cotton Bale came out of Pakistan. And now, you know, uh, the big uh, uh, textile manufacturers are using Better Cotton in their articles. And they include, you know, Al Karam, Gul Ahmed, uh, Kuti, Artistic, US Denim, you, Nishat, you name it, and they are uh, linked to that program. Uh, the same approach is being replicated now for uh, rice as part of sustainable rice platform. And uh, even now we are planning for sugarcane, which is bon sucro, again, a global standard objective is to promote practices which reduce the water footprint. Now let's come to, let's come to the industry. Uh, again, we, uh, we have a, a, a program where we are working with leather and textile industry we do the audits of these sectors. We identify areas where they can reduce the water and energy footprint. And, and then we encourage them, we convince them uh, to make that investment with a business case. It's very important for the sustainability of you know, this work. It, you know, we can't afford that this has to be a typical NGO project, which is now funded by a donor. The donor funding is over and the project is over. That's that has never helped. And uh, pilots, uh, the unfortunate part is the pilots never fail and pilots never scale up. So with that in mind, you know, whether uh, our work with uh, farmers, whether we our work with industry, uh, we try to have uh, a business case. And as a science-based organization, I think it's critically important that you have the right partnership with the academic and research institutes so that, so, all the practices, everything that we are promoting, we, you know, we, it's not our research. It's the research done by the agriculture universities, by PARC, by International Water Management Institute. And so, similarly, we are using some of the research done at, at your center, which, you know, uh, where we're using technology for uh, groundwater monitoring, for water flow monitoring, just to ensuring that what is the impact at the catchment level. Now, let me also share with you a couple of other uh, initiatives that we are very excited about. So uh, we are embarking upon a very ambitious project. It's called Recharge Pakistan. Um, so this project is uh, uh, funded by uh, the Green Climate Fund, GCF. At the moment, they have approved the project preparation fund. This is a project where we want to revive all the wetlands. We want to ensure that we manage the flood waters. We are talking about the surplus flood water. We are not talking about Irsa water, which is, again, we all know is very sensitive. You intrude and then, you know, you've given a shut up call and then, you know, it's highly politicized. So it's, we are talking about the surplus flood water that how, uh, you know, you can manage that. How can you link the main river body with the natural ponds, with the natural wetlands? So doing that, you can improve uh, the groundwater aquifers because that would recharge. And that's the reason that the, when this project was presented uh, to the prime minister, uh, he, he changed because originally the name was quite big. He changed the name to recharge Pakistan because he was convinced that through this project, we'll be in a better position to recharge the, the dwindling aquifers of, of Pakistan. Um, so it will be good for ecology, it will be good for people, it will be good for literally uh, everybody. So at the moment, we are uh, doing, we are starting the feasibility studies, uh, and we are very hopeful that this will be funded. The main project will also be funded by GCF, because, you know, you have to compete with uh, literally every country in the world. Uh, another uh, activity, which is the Alliance for Water Stewardship. We strongly believe that water is, is a business risk for many businesses. It's not a reputational risk. It's not. So we have to, you know, uh, treat it as a business risk. 
So companies like particularly FMCG companies who uh, depend on water for their business, I think they have to uh, they have to go beyond their fences. So obviously, first they have to look into you know into their operations, into their production processes, make changes. Uh, they have to be water uh, neutral, uh, ideally water positive, and then to go beyond you know uh, 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 it's a phased approach. Um, and then, you know, it's about uh, water, uh, watershed management, catchment area management. Um, and then also there are now these companies like Nestle, Coke, Pepsi, who have these corporate targets to replenish, you know, the water that they use. And uh, I think that's the initiative that you link them with uh, uh, Alliance for Water Stewardship uh, certification where they certify their facilities and then they go beyond. Because at the end of the day, uh, you know, this challenge needs a collective action. It, it's not that WWF or some other organizations comes up uh, and prescribe a solution. We have to co-create solutions. I think that's the key. Uh, but with that, you know, while co-creating, we have to look at these millions of people who depend you know, on, on the water in our water bodies for drinking. We have to look for these millions of people who live in the Delta. We look for the millions of people who live up in the North and they are exposed to GLOF and other uh, impacts. We have to look at the millions of people who are exposed to drought and floods. So if we keep that in mind, water will automatically, you know, uh, uh, becomes a priority for literally, uh, you know, every organization, not just WWF. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, since you spoke of businesses, let me now come to Vakar and ask him, how do you uh, value water and how is it that you uh, address the issue of sustainability um, in the industry that is uh, using water as a resource? Thank you very much, Dr. Fazio. Uh, and I think uh, we are very excited the way uh, I think the discussion today, they are some very critical thoughts were shared here and these are all challenging thoughts and i think one must always look forward to these thoughts because they help you improve and make sure that you know the private sector come as a responsible part of this and part of the solution rather part of the challenge and we always look forward to that uh, for nestle i think one of the key player in pakistan one of the very important players in agriculture uh, we are a we see ourselves as a agri-based company because again for we being a food and beverage companies water is a very critical part of our uh, the processes whether inside our fences or outside our fences because we work on grains we work on milk so we work with farmers so there the water is very very important it's a very scarce source that we all know so we have to bring efficiency not only inside but outside our fence with our the all these stakeholders that i mentioned and in our value chain uh, we, uh, and as a good water steward, uh, it is our responsibility that we see things responsibly. Uh, we make sure that, you know, as part of our global sustainability agenda, so among three priorities where the climate change is one, sustainability packaging is two, and water remains a very important one, and water stewardship is the uh, one of the key agenda, uh, key topic uh, under that. And we, we consider water as a shared resource. So whenever is we look at this, this issue, we see that, you know, we have to be part of this, the challenge, we have to contribute and we see how we could do that. Uh, when it comes to our facilities, we found ourselves among the most efficient players. Uh, reducing use of water every coming day and uh, we have targets that we you know we look for a water neutral in days to come and hopefully with all these effort will be will be there uh, as well uh, and uh, you know that's why we launched this a uh, global uh, uh, campaign where under water steward we launched this caring for water and Pakistan market is one of the lighthouse markets where uh, idea is to work uh, not only uh, as I mentioned, inside our factories, uh, is outside with the farmers and on the policy making uh, as well. And this is today's initiative is also the part of that initiative as well. So we, we, can, we can have open discussion on this issue. Uh, and doing that, I think uh, what Hamad mentioned is very clearly uh, on Alliance for Water Stewardship is one thing where we have really, uh, again, we are uh, probably the only uh, multinational in the, uh, in, in the country who has all sites are today 
approved under AWS. So uh, this is a certification. So it's, you know, practically we've been audited and uh, annually these audits are done. And then of course we have to reach to certain targets and we, we've been achieving it for last, at least for our largest site, Shekhupura for the last three years. And the last site which I've just done in Port Qasim in Karachi and two other sites. So all are done. So those all are, you know, things uh, in terms of certification when it comes to, because at times people go by certification. Uh, so we do that. But again, it's, it's a very responsibility that we have to work with farmers. So in, with farmers, be very clear that, you know, reducing water usage in agriculture is very important for us. That's why together in collaboration with the agriculture uh, department in Punjab, we are very actively working on drip irrigation. So in our value chain, there are more than, uh, I think hundreds of farmers who are working on drip irrigation now. Of course, we cannot resolve all the issues, but we are creating lighthouses all parts of Punjab and parts and even with PRC, we have a lighthouse farm there as well. And now we are expanding that activity. So uh, interestingly, so far we have done almost 160 acres. And on those 60, 160 acres, we are, we are saving more than uh, 400 million liters every year. And that's how the, you know, the journey has started. Uh, it comes, you know, it creates a very important role for LUMS where we worked and developed uh, those water sensors with them. So this is complemented with drip irrigation. So it's not only that, you know, the water, which is scarce, so you use it carefully and give it when it's required. Uh, for farmer, we equip them with these kind of water sensors, which help them to understand when the, when the soil requires water, where the moisture level is low or high, so that, you know, even the drip, irrigation which is a very efficient method it can be further emphasized and then it's water is used in those in those farms so those kind of activities are there and the purpose is to you know behave as responsibly as possible collaborate with the right partners whether it's wwf is lums uh, is department of agriculture uh, we work very closely with the sdpi also so there we working with uh, you know with policy sharing with them our views how we can uh, you know, what contribution the private sector, and it's not only about Nestle. Uh, the purpose here is Nestle as a, as a large corporation can create a lighthouse for other private sector companies so that they can look at us, learn, and then together we can deliver on this agenda. Uh, irrespective that, you know, the water is, we all know that main usage of water in the countries and agriculture, but uh, nevertheless, I think uh, private sector has a very important role has to play. And I, as I said in the start, starting from inside. So, you know, we have to ensure the right of, you know, the water, water which is going outside of factories is a, as, at the standard which is given by the uh, by the government. We're making sure that, you know, the water in our production has to be efficient. Uh, and that's every coming day we are improving that. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a very collective action that we have looked at and all the players have to work together and wherever we can learn, wherever we can uh, contribute positively towards this agenda, we are ready to do that. And we are committed to do that, not only in Pakistan, but also globally. Uh, so that's how uh, I would see it as a, I think, role of private sector. And uh, of course, not everyone will get satisfied with that, but that's, I think it's a journey. So we start from here. We trying to do something good and we would like others to join and whatever we can do better in coming days, we'll certainly do that. As I said, we are fully committed on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wakar. Um, and yeah, I mean, you're very right. This is very, very important. But let me come back to uh, see me now and speak about something that's very close to my heart uh, because I know agricultural communities and I am a second generation non-practicing farmer. Um, so I think in a way, uh, because around Women's Day, there was a lot of discussion on the role of women in farming and in agriculture. And even though more than 90% of the women are directly involved in agriculture and agricultural communities, um, their say in decision-making is very less. So less than 20% of uh, the decisions involve uh, women. Um, and there's a lot of inequality, I think, and inequity in the way agriculture is practiced and policies are envisioned. Um, and we do know that water is important for livelihood and food and nutrition, nutrition security of not just women, but the communities at large. Uh, how do you see a disparity in practice uh, in that for Pakistan? Okay. Uh, what women have to face is part of a whole range of inequalities and disparities that, you know, we have to deal with every single day. I'll, I'll come to that in a way by connecting it to some of the discussions we've had uh, already. 
Yes, no, we have a global decade of reviving wetlands globally. So this is starting this year. So that's that's something really important that we need to get into. In in the old language, we had so many words uh, like talab, johar, jheel that talked about storing water. Um, you know, in pond, this was pondage. I really believe that pondage is the major way forward for Pakistan, and we really need to be um, thinking about it very, very seriously. But you know, we are caught in in the thinking which says that only very big infrastructure is development. And that small things are not development, and especially if they're not funded and not projectized, and if they are things that people just do, we don't count it as development. So there is this whole thinking which we need to change in terms of connecting to those that I'm uh, talking talking about. There are many things that people, individuals, and households will just have to do. Some of them are already doing it. All that traditional wisdom needs to be brought into the kind of knowledge base and the science base that I was talking about earlier. And you know we have to give it equal value than what uh, engineers are coming up with, for example. And how, how we bridge that gap and how we uh, give equal weightage and equal respect to those voices, that is really a huge challenge. But uh, it's not just a challenge, there are solutions. I mean, I, I said earlier, we need to talk, talk about solutions. There are ways to do that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So we have to move from projectization to peopleization, okay? And that peopleization means a very different way of thinking, um, uh, whether it's the corporate sector, whether it's the development sector or the UN agencies, whether it's governments and others. Now, basic drinking water and domestic water for households has to remain, and then water for agriculture you know we are an, as i said earlier we are an agricultural society and we don't need to get away from it we need to be proud of it and we need to shore up this this resource those have to be part of uh, continue to be part of the solution but you know we we talk a lot, lot about csr csr is part of the solution it's a small part there are many other things we have to do if you just look globally there are 86 individuals in the world who now own more wealth than all the countries put together and they spend only 0.04% of their wealth on CSR. Okay, so CSR is good, but it's, it's just one part. We need to really focus on so many other things. Now, if you want to connect all the dots, we need to connect the science, the water economy, the person power, what Abu Bakr was talking about, producing the right person power, those who go to MIT and those who stay back those who work at the highest level and those who work on the little farm all of them have to be connected and we have to produce everything in between that can only be done in a degrowth model otherwise we will keep losing all you know the brain drain will continue to happen so the person power at all levels the university research linked to action i really really respect what abu bakar does and I really respect what Hamar does. I, I consider them my water family, okay? And hopefully some of the rest of you will also be part of that. We talk all the time on so many different fora. And uh, so those are the, the dots we need to link together, okay? So if we produce these wonderful young people, men and women who know the water science and they, they know the water economy, if they want to set up a water business, then what? The microfinance don't have a plan. Uh, Pakistani uh, don't have a plan at the water water conferences that we do every, every two years. We have continuously brought the banks and told them, when are you going to look at Pakistan's water economy and start funding it? Okay. Finally, finally, after all this time, we have the case of uh, HBL that has fund funding part funding Dasudam, and we have the case recently where the National Bank has now is now supporting a water business. Interestingly, to convert wastewater into into usable water, but it has taken like 20 years to get people to think about. It. Even now, bankers go blank when we talk about the water economy. So. If you don't connect those dots, we are going to remain in the backwaters of water development in spite of the CSR, in spite of the training. So connect the dot, that's what, how do we do it? By this water family, we have a think tank on the rational use of water uh, from people all over Pakistan. And we say water is everyone's business. So we are not saying it has to be water specialists. Building consensus, we have to talk to each other, whether it's the provinces, whether it's different, we don't talk, that is the issue. 
And now let's come to women. We don't talk to women. We don't want to hear them. Okay. During this whole course, I've spent four decades fighting in this. And even now I find that I have to defend myself. And I have to say that, yes, I really am a water specialist because people don't believe that women can be water specialists or water engineers or water thinkers. Okay. Hamar knows this too. You know what a struggle we had when we were working on the um, IBRM model for Indus Basin and uh, all the flack we got because we said we didn't want dams and we said we wanted to bring women into everything. You remember those very interesting sessions? So it's, I'll give you a more recent example uh, of working on water policy. How can you make a water policy for a country without having the voices of 50% of its population? Okay who are actually responsible for micromanagement of water, whether it's at home or whether it's on the farm. How can you do that? But we do it with impunity because we believe that the only water voice is the voice of the water engineer. And the only water development is infrastructure. Then the, there was the whole water policy work which is going on in Sin. So there were all these pictures with 200 men sitting there. So I wrote to them and I said, well, you know, put some, so they said, Madam, I'm not doing it to put me there. I will give you names of 50 good women in Sindh whom you can call. And then that's how we started the campaign of uh, women water champions and it's still going on and it won't stop until we have 200 or 300 women water professionals pointed out. And we don't want women there because they're women. We want them there because they're water professionals, because they're water scholars. You know, because they have done something, because they are farmers, because they are thinkers, because they are in, in media. That's why we want them there. So, you know, it's such an old debate. I don't, we keep on trying to just defend why women should be in the water sector. We need to move on, find the women, put them into important places and put them into water science. I think that's really important. So they are there at the grass. I know some young women in universities. There's a young woman at Kadiazum Universities who's made a very simple system to take arsenic out of water. She's been struggling to get a patent for that. And you know, to get, it is, it is her, her, uh, her professor who helped her, another woman, okay? I mean, recently we had this, uh, this course on developing women leaders in the water sector through the Water Institute that uh, I'm helping put up at NED University. And there were three international women who got pulled out at the last minute. I called each one of them myself. And in all three cases, there were the male bosses who said to them, there's something else more important to do. So building women's leadership in the water sector is not a priority. And if it is not a priority, we are not going to move forward. We are going to be stuck in the same debate. So we must understand also that uh, women are the linchpins around water systems and around food systems. You know, the environmental entitlements have formed a very basic part of food security in this country. And that has been run entirely by women. So you can take the berries from the trees, you can go and pick the sticks, you know, to make your stove, that you can use water from the gauchers and the shamilats. Those things, we, we never talk about that because that is part of the economy, the real economy that, that women run. And as a friend of mine called Gabriel Blair, she writes these wonderful, wonderful threads on Twitter, which I may pass on. So she addressed men and said, you know, you don't protect children by taking a gun and walking outside the house. You protect women by washing their hands, keeping them clean, giving them food, nurturing them. So this, this is the kind of basis of the water economy in Pakistan that we have not explored at all. And we need to do that. We need to do that at universities, in building the science, in building whatever else we like to do. But please, I would just like to ask all of you to really think seriously with what is happening in climate change, happening faster than we, we said. With a two degree world, we have already written off all the tropical countries. They're not gonna survive this, okay? But to whatever extent that they can, we have to switch to models of degrowth and equality and access if we are to really surmount this big chain. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for like, rightly mentioning that we need to move it from debate to actually action and not just talking about it for the sake of talking about it, but actually bringing it into practice. I think that's that's more important because on many days that we observe, we just talk about them and then, then forget about them for the rest of the year. Um, so let me come to uh, Dr. Bashir then and ask him um, 
that we, we talked about how much water goes at the input level in agriculture, and, and that's more than 90%. But in terms of practice, I think a lot of water that goes into agriculture is wa wasted. And as data suggests, it's more than 70%. And this wastage, I think, is, a, is global as much as it is um, at, at Pakistan level. Um, how do you think can we, um, are we addressing this issue in Pakistan? And how are we trying to minimize the waste uh, that, that is coming from the agriculture sector, which is now a new form of wastewater with yeah. rich nutrients that is causing eutrophication and uh, contamination of water bodies that lie downstream. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Fazia, and uh, thank you, Athika. Uh, uh, that's uh, most important, as well as, as you said, that uh, uh, we are wasting uh, uh, about 70% uh, of uh, water sources uh, due to very poor water uh, conveyance system as well as the water application system. Uh, so in a system, so we need to uh, make a transformational shift from flood irrigation to high efficient irrigation system. Uh, maybe as uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, uh, Mr. Mohsen, uh, Lagaris have said that, uh, yeah, uh, DRC as well as uh, many other institutions we have been working on uh, uh, efficient irrigation methods. Uh, we uh, introduced this uh, drip and uh, um, sprinkler irrigation system uh, way back uh, early 90s. And unfortunately, uh, if we compare this uh, with the neighbor as well as uh, over the world, so mm, mm, uh, we are unaware, I would say, with the consistent uh, institutional support, with the consistent uh, uh, government financial support, as government is uh, uh, providing a lot of subsidy. Uh, but uh, we have uh, just uh, reached about uh, 80,000 uh, acres in Pakistan, whereas uh, in uh, uh, India, it has uh, gone to one, uh, about 1.5 uh, million hectares at a farm level. So we need to, uh, I mean, in terms of the technology, uh, uh, I mean, it is the uh, most successful technology in the world, uh, whereas you go to uh, Australia, whereas you go to Israel, whereas you go to um, um, Gulf states and India. So uh, there's no issue with the technology. Uh, as uh, the, uh, Mr. Mohsen said that uh, there's an issue uh, with the adoption of this technology. Uh, I mean, uh, and this is a state of the technology and uh, we just uh, mm, uh, bring this technology at the farmer's uh, doorsteps without uh, proper giving them uh, awareness as well as training. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it's right. But uh, maybe the uh, uh, public institution, they don't have this capacity. So uh, presently government uh, is now focusing on uh, resolving these issue and how we can build the capacities of uh, the farmers. So we need to bring the uh, uh, service provider sector so, uh, so that they can uh, bridge this gap uh, where uh, institution, government institution cannot uh, uh, solve this problem. So, uh, uh, PRC, uh, we, we are introducing uh, a service provider as well as uh, which can provide these services and uh, uh, integration with the uh, public institution. And there, Mr. Uh, Mosab, uh, yes, uh, uh, on a larger scale, we, uh, we, we don't have a very good success, but at an individual scale, there are now really very good success stories. Uh, where uh, farmers uh, have uh, developed these system and they are uh, earning uh, uh, a lot from those systems. So we need to document these uh, stories and uh, uh, publicize these stories so that the, our, uh, um, you can say the farmer's perception uh, that uh, this is, uh, technology doesn't uh, uh, fulfill irrigation needs so they can, they can be uh, educated. And uh, like if you compare with the India, they uh made uh, uh the one authority irrigation uh, uh task force on micro irrigation in india in 2003 and uh, with the consistent government support uh, now uh, the things change in india 
Huh? Am I audible? Yes, you are. Ah, okay, sorry. Uh, so uh, 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 for this one uh, at an institutional sport, but uh, there must be, uh, I would say, uh, consistent uh, uh, political as well, uh, policy sport as well for uh, these uh, systems. And uh, we need to uh, further uh, disintegrate uh, uh, this uh, uh, irrigation, uh, canal irrigation, as well as uh, this high efficient irrigation. So uh, maybe uh, at a first step, uh, we should focus uh in Khodar region in uh, uh, balochistan and those areas so uh, where uh, we have water scarcity the people don't have any choice so and um, uh, there is adoption chances are uh, should be very high and uh, government uh, uh, under this government uh, uh, under the pm emergency program one a mega project has been launched and uh, it, it, uh, that is more focused in those areas uh, uh, you can say uh, there's a one a good step uh, in this direction but uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to, uh, as this technology is very costly and uh, it's indigen indigenization as well as local production uh, should be uh, started. So uh, this was uh, in terms of uh, drip and sprinkler irrigation. But now uh, I'll move uh, one, we are a PRC and we are very happy, uh, uh, excited about uh, the new technology. So we are introducing two uh, new technologies uh, uh, that is a uh, responsive drip irrigation. In most of the irrigation technologies, uh, it's the human who decide uh, when to irrigate and how to irrigate based on uh, various uh, methods in terms of, uh, you can say, uh, soil master gadgets or uh, based on their experience. So people decide how, uh, when to irrigate. Uh, uh, the one of uh, new irrigation technology developed by the USA that is known as a responsive uh, drip irrigation. So we are working with that uh, uh, company and uh, we have tested this technology uh, in uh, Potowa region at, uh, uh, at our farm as well as at few farmers. And uh, yesterday, uh, and the company people, Americans are with us and uh, we had a uh, two days training and uh, now we are uh, planning to uh, have a trial all over the country especially in uh, ecologies uh, what stress ecologies in Blochstan as well as uh, uh, in Sin. So uh, uh, this is a new form of technology uh, where uh, a water uh, uh, pipes are laid near the root zone of the cr uh, crops or plants. Uh, water uh, is made available 24-7 uh, uh, into that uh, um, pipe system. And uh, like uh, when water, uh, plant need water, it uh, emits signals in search of water and nutrients. So this new technology, the pipe system is uh, a polymer uh, kind of system. So when the plant signal uh, 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 interact with the uh, with this pipe. So pipes, uh, which is made of thousands of pores, so it the pores are open and uh, it start emitting uh, water. Uh, so it is uh, you can say kind of automated uh, technology, very encouraging technology. So uh, in terms of our trials, so we have trialed, uh, we have tested that on uh, vegetable as, a, as well as in fruits, and it gives uh, about 40 to 70 percent uh, efficiency. I mean, less water use compared to the drip, compared to the drip, and uh, uh, about 30 to 50 percent more yield. As well as there's a lot of convenience in terms of uh, uh, its uh, application. So you only need to uh, make sure a 24 hour water is available in the pipe, and uh, uh, then it's a function of the pipe as well as uh, uh, the plant. So uh, it's highly encouraging technology. And uh, uh, although we have a very good uh, uh, trust in the technology based on our trials. And uh, we have now started a uh, country-wise trial over there. And uh, it seems that uh, that would be a very encouraging te uh, technology to, uh, especially for the water case area. Uh, so based on our uh, trial, so we have uh, tested uh, at a farmer's field with the uh, one acre and two acre. So uh, you can say uh, it would be a blessing for the 
vulnerable communities, what uh, stressed communities, low farmer, uh, 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 farmer, so they can uh, uh, generate uh, uh, its livelihood. So, and this is the one of uh, uh, future technologies. So, uh, after the trial, we we will uh, be working with the development sector, and uh, uh, maybe a government uh, could uh, initiate uh, uh, some project like. Uh, uh, the drip irrigation system. And uh, then uh, uh, we are uh, testing two more technologies which, uh, which are already, uh, I mean, uh, although mm, highly uh, seems effective, uh, that is uh, grossest technology and cocoon technology. So uh, these are technologies uh, uh, where uh, mm, one plant, one fruit tree, as well as uh, one uh, 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 forest tree can be planted. And uh, these technologies, uh, uh, Dr. Bashir? Okay. Dr. Walker, maybe I can uh, come towards you um, and, and, and ask you, uh, I think it, I want to relate it to a question that we've had from uh, the, on the comment section on our social media live. Uh, first is of course, um, you know, we, we somehow after all the practices and, and all the things that we discuss, we then um, ask for a technology to come and save us. Uh, and and be and and be a solution provider, um, and of course we're talking about some uh, ways to to improve efficiency. And based on the practices that we use, we can uh, bring uh, water close to the root of the plant, or we can take it away from the root of the plant. So I think it depends on what technology and practices we need for that particular region that we want to solve the problem for. And uh, of course you've been doing some work on this and. Um, and you are also trying to couple it with the practice side of things. So I would, I think I would like for you to highlight how technology in combination with the right practice uh, or sustainable intensification and agriculture can really take off uh, the future. And the question that we've had online says, what, uh, what measures our farmers can take to use the current water resources effectively without wasting it? So I think in a way it, it relates to the technology and practice side as well. So I'll, I'll leave it for you. Thank you, Fazia. So I think we have, we, have, uh, we have heard all this many, many times before. There are all these wonderful technologies available. I mean, so whenever I hear a government official or a, or a research organization talk about like 50 different options available that we can do this, 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 we, we have to really think about that. We have been investing, for example, on drip irrigation now for how many years? Two decades now? I think tens of billions of rupees have poured into, into, into that and with no result. I mean, really, we have to think about it. I mean, what is it that we are not doing correctly? I mean, drip irrigation 20 years back was a very, uh, very uh, promising technology. It still is. But then why is it not taking off? Uh, unless we get answers to those questions, I think talking about various technologies, A, B, C, D, I think it does not, does not matter. I would, however, talk about one particular one, which is very close to, to my heart, is, is this water sensor uh, uh, gadget that we have made really indigenizing it for the local farmers, going out in, into the field, trying it out, out, mixing it with the actual practice of sustainable intensification, where we are not only helping them actually convert their lands on the field, on, on this, for example, mulching, whether it is uh, uh, intercropping, uh, um, doing multiple crops at the same time, raised, raised beds and all that, but also use of these gadgets, be very, very low cost gadgets, uh, not very high fly uh, kind of things in order to, uh, to do, do proper decisions. But coming back to that drip irrigation, I mean, I can, I can portray it to the government agencies that, well, maybe this is the next big thing to do, but then let's look at why drip irrigation did not take off. Uh, a, because there is no indigenization. I mean, uh, you, you go to company A, you go to company B, you go to the US, you go to Australia. Why are we not developing this technology in, 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 in the country? Uh, Simi talked about the military industrial complex. I mean, let's learn from them. Uh, Pakistan is doing wonderful work within the defense sector. I mean, we are doing producing our own uh, uh, fifth generation aircraft. Let's learn from the military guys. And, and the reason that they are successful in that particular thing is because they are indigenizing. I have worked for a couple of years before going for my graduate uh, studies within that military <laughs> industrial complex. And believe me, because of the sanctions, because of what we were forced to do in-house, they were able to uh, roll these technologies out 
and and they work very effectively as you can see i mean as far as the military is concerned there is no debate that we do do very well when it comes to one to one uh, combat i mean why why not do the same thing for our agriculture sector as well why insist on bringing these technologies from the outside when there is so much talent here uh, lift the local industry as i've said before for example look at our agricultural uh, engineering industry standardize it uh, bring these new mechatronic robotics sensors these ict technologies uh, start producing it indigenously instead of bringing all these companies from the outside and try to do it i mean you can you can see some things that way so that is one thing indigenization second thing as lagari saab said at the very beginning was that there is actually no value of water even if you do the drip irrigation even if you do the very fancy water sensors or even if you do some very sustainable agriculture uh, agricultural practices for saving water whatever you save save has no economic value to the farmer and this is what we are finding out as well uh, even if you install that drip whatever water that you save because the that neri pani has no no value there Uh, for for the, for the for the for the farmers who can actually invest into these technologies it does not make an economic sense that is the big reason that it has not taken off uh, within the uh, fertile irrigated areas of punjab because maybe you can do it in the uh, uh, the, the, the arid areas where already uh, there is uh, you need to invest a lot into the uh, into the water to bring it there so there, there it does make sense but when water is so free so 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 sort of uh, has no value that even if you put in drones or uh, drip irrigation or whatever i mean nothing will actually uh, work out third thing is basically training uh, that uh, whatever technology that you are bringing in as i said that this is not just a matter of making something available all of a sudden i mean it has to really scale up where training is not just having these uh, uh, farmer uh, cuts or whatever yadi aap 200 farmers ko ikattha karke aap ek cheez lehraye and then you can say okay this will work for you uh, what i really mean is getting the habib university lums university ned graduates into these these areas wo apni companies banaye wo service providers bane they they have to be the one who should, should, should scale it forward the farmer should not worry about in exactly the same way as you get a cable in your house i mean you don't need to worry about where to get the cable and how to connect it to the tv it just works you just pay your bill in the same way if, if we are providing to you an irrigation advisory service whether it is drip or whether it is a fancy water sensor or it is a drone flying above i mean it should be a service that should come to your to your house and who is going to provide that service i'm sorry to say these are not going to be the agriculture university graduates these are going to be a very different breed of people uh, who or uh, or graduates or or, or disciplines who, who have to come into this 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 thing uh, produce startups or engage with private businesses bring multinationals like uh the nestles and the pepsis and the cokes or whatever on board invest into this uh invest into these areas and and may make these as as businesses um so last of all um you have to keep in mind that it's not just on farm i mean you 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 bring in a water efficiency or or water productivity would be the would be the better word as hamad was saying you bring these kind of technologies but you also need to think about that what happens if there is wide scale adoption we have not tackled that problem yet i mean you have looked at the cng situation in pakistan i mean you put in the cng kits and all of the you know the vehicles and then poof goes the uh, uh, our uh, natural gas supply are you going to do the same thing with our water sector as well you put in these irrigation efficiency devices people are going to irrigate more people are going to use that water to irrigate more lands that's a very well known economic effect the, the so called uh, uh, yevans paradox or there are all these back effects that that people talk about it's called the irrigation efficiency paradox it's very well known in the water literature as well so we we will come to that road as well so we keep talking about water productivity and water efficiency what will happen if large scale adoption takes place and we have this reverse effect so all these things we need to be prepared for and think about before we actually start to talk about a particular technology and for you i'm so happy that what we are doing is not just things that we can build we can build very very complex things but purposely we are doing things that only matter and that can be taken to the field and farmers can adopt coupling them with their actual practices i i am not talking about the 1000 acre farm i am talking about the 5 acre farm the 2 acre farmer it, it, does this technology can help that farmer or not and whether that farmer can adapt that technology or not if i am able to solve that problem then it's an innovation otherwise i mean the robots are out there i mean you can you can just go and and import them or buy them or whatever 
Absolutely. So I hear that Hamad Saab has to leave uh, soon. So maybe I can uh, address one of the questions to him before I go back to Wakar. Um, there is a question uh, on how can we get uh, the people involved in all of this? How can we involve the masses in improving water conservation and in, in valuing water? Like how, because you are part of, involved in uh, education and awareness as well, but how can we really scale it up in terms of education and awareness? Because in the end, that's where we, where we lag. Okay, I mean, the, the fact is that uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the level of awareness, uh, it has improved. Maybe it hasn't improved to the level uh, that we want, but at least in the uh, urban areas, in, uh, you know, a section of the, the private sector, uh, at the at the government level, you can see, you know, many people talking about uh, you know the water challenges. The so I think the role of media obviously is is very important, and we have been asking to uh, to the government that as per Ramra regulations, ten percent of the air time has to be spent on public service messaging. So uh, we have to ensure, like, but again, you know, all these uh, groups. Um, so WWF writes to Ramra sometimes they listen, sometimes and a lot of times they don't listen. So that's where, uh, and then we need to bombard this information. We need to we need to develop, uh, you know, uh, this notion that why is it important for an individual to play, uh, you know, his or her role? It's not about one sector. It's not about uh, one group. Legislation um, and the policy directions they are there. I mean, there were gaps, but they they've been you know fulfilled. Um, as long as it doesn't become a priority uh, for the government, where it's not just you know uh, an issue for irrigation or for agriculture or for uh, WAPTA, literally every department, whether it's mining, whether it's industries, whether it's forest and wildlife, every department you know has to take uh, water uh, seriously and give the priority that it deserves at the moment if it's everybody's responsible then no one is responsible and we always talk about having an integrated approach we always talk about iwrm and you know collective but we don't see uh, things happening on ground where there's a i mean there is a Pakistan water council have they met there's a provincial water councils have they met? So that shows, you know, it's not about setting up a forum, setting up of priorities. Uh, some media houses, you know, uh, are uh, very supportive uh, and then they include that. But it's not, I think, literally the challenge that we have every day should be a World Water Day in Pakistan. Absolutely. And I mean, you mentioned it rightly that in terms of giving airtime and communication time to these messages, yeah. I'm sure that it does at times cost you as well, because we on our cell phone, we get so many text messages from brands that we didn't even sign up for. But how many times do we get text messages saying today's World Water Day and this is what we need yeah. to do or general what messages about conserving water in our day to day life? We never do that. Mm -hmm. And who like who is going to take th those sort of decisions to make sure that this discussion goes beyond uh, these smaller forums that we hold and goes to every household and every PTA user and, and tells them that here are the three things through which you can save water or here's the top two technologies yeah. that are available to the farmer. So how do we go from them not connecting with connected with us to, to finally bringing them into the loop with gadgets and technologies that already exist? Um, so let me go now to Wakar because I think we need to wrap it up in, in a while. Um, what, what do you think is the importance of collective action in conserving water? And what have you done about it? Do you have any stories that you would like to share? So I, I think I'll start from where uh, Hamad just left by saying every day should be a water day. And I think that's that's a mindset that we require at all levels, whether we are academia, we are industry or the think tanks or nonprofits, activists. It's, this is what, and individuals as well. So I think, and when we all put them together and every day is a water day, is a collective action that we can look at. I think that's most important. And as one message, I think one should, should take it that, you know, it's everyone's issue. It's not industry issue. It's not agriculture issue. 
uh, it's not academia issue. So I think that's what we all need to think in, on the same on the same lines. Uh, what we are doing, we I've mentioned few examples on uh, I think uh, when it sums on collective action. Uh, I think we have our caring for water program is building together, working with so many institutions together, and we're trying to bring them all together once in a year or twice a year, uh, reaching out to policymakers, sensitize them, and uh, taking up this responsibility. At times, we have to, you know, uh, we have we come under heat also by saying that I don't know what you are doing, but again, we are ready to take that risk because this issue is so important uh, that you, I think we need to sensitize is all of uh, all of the stakeholders are there and the caring for water initiative by nestle is providing this opportunity where we are not only you know today uh, if you look at industry on our uh, the efficiency level where we are probably in pakistan i would say we are few of the very most efficient industry that that we are in at the moment but when we go outside our fence there are so many challenges and that's more important for us because as i mentioned in the start we are a green in company because we convert milk into a packaged milk we convert rice into our uh, in our food brands we convert uh, you know many other grains uh, convert a lot of fruits into you know into juices into juice drinks and uh, so th those are those are very you know uh, things that are closer to our heart and is important for us to look into a value chain uh, so and with with all the pressures coming in with you know the us dollar going up uh, why i'm bringing it here you know it's becoming more and more important every day to uh, procure food fruit material fruits and other grains locally and uh, when you go locally you have to work more closer to the farmer and then every day you find the challenge you know how you make them efficient when it comes because the, now it's becoming our purely our value chain so those are the intervention we we need to look into it and uh, we are working uh, you know from gilgit to koita so there are fruits which are coming from now gilgit uh, today lots of apple are coming from there so we're looking at interventions you know how we work with the farmers there we are uh, so our milk comes from mostly from punjab and parts of sind so we're looking at farmers you know how we can those farmers who are you are who are uh, growing fodder how we can help them reduce how can they have multiple crops how we they can have efficient crops which can reduce less use of water and then looking for interventions we look like partners like uh, uh, lums uh, you know where what technology solutions we can introduce to our farmers and that, that's why we work very closely with lums we look for uh, you know agriculture department and irrigation department see you know uh, if the irrigation department looking at you know the water resources that are going to the farmer how those can be efficient what ro what role we can play with agriculture department uh, you know there's a it's a uh, why drip irrigation has been effective for our farmers, I would say, is because there's a uh, agriculture department is working with World Bank, where 60% of the financing for all all, agri all these irrigation units comes from uh, from World Bank funding, but there's still a gap of 40%. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, farmers were hesitant why they have to introduce that because all the challenges that uh, Mohsin Saab mentioned in the start, you know, because uh, either it's expensive or it's how to manage it. But then with the, with the, with, when Nestle comes on, on the back of the farmer, they have much more reliability because they have worked with us for the last 30 years. They know how we work with them, how we respond to their challenges, how we try to resolve this, uh, their problems there and come back with a solution and which is a business oriented solution so we are putting up our money in terms of going for this drip irrigation the 40 percent now is pumped in by nestle and we are creating lighthouses so that you know the farmers who who can see all those activities they can adopt those activities in the surrounding areas as well and the plan is for the next five years that we are going to push this further working with the agriculture department working with lumps you know we are already talking to you guys uh, we are expanding on the water sensors, so we want to bring more efficiency. So that you know, when it when we uh, people should not look Nestle as what we are doing inside our factory. We know we are we are good. Uh, probably we we can create gold standard, but then what is important for us in our value chain, where the grains are coming in, where the milk is coming in, where the fruits are coming in, those farmers need need to adopt. And uh, you know, it's uh, we all started this drip irrigation with only our. Uh, milk farmers, but now we have gone to our Gava farmers with our mango farmers, and now we're taking it to. We started creating lighthouses with the uh, U.S. in Patoki campus. We have created a lighthouse at PRC in Islamabad, so that you know the farmers can come and see and see how efficiency can you know reduce use of water in their operations also. 
So that's what is important for us. The value chain concept is the most important for us, and there the collective action comes in. So that's where WWF becomes important. SDPI is a think tank comes important. SDT, SDPI is a very, uh, you know, they have a strength of talking to policymakers. So it's important that they talk to policymaker. You guys, uh, LAMS comes up with a technology solution. Uh, WWF, keep us on the toes. Tell us what are the right things to do. Uh, I would suggest uh, Madam Simi is here. She's all, we always listen to her very carefully. And it's very important that, you know, we listen to all those, even the critics that we have, you know, and then we we try to uh, improve ourselves, and that's how this is the journey. And uh, Musil Saab said very rightly in the start, you know, he keeps on learning. Every time he connects with people, he learns. So we as a company also, every time we connect with stakeholder, we try to learn and improve ourselves. And that's the journey. And hopefully, as a collective action, we will deliver on that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I think I've been asked to wrap up, but I would still like to take quick comments from uh, Simi, uh, Dr. Bubakar. Uh, Dr. Bashir, and perhaps we, I can end then with uh, Mohsen sir giving his final remarks. No, water conservation has to be owned by all of us in all sectors. And everyone has their own places where they must work, whether it's Nestle, whether it's Lums. And we need to cooperate and we need to criticize each other. This is how we move forward. I'd just like to say on something that Abubakar mentioned about how the Pakistan army became self-reliant. Yes, that's great. That if that's what we need to learn from them, yes, we should learn that. And we must also remember that they were able to do that because there were so many resources that were pumped. So we need, if, if the water sector has resources like that, I'm sure that we can also become self-reliant. Thank you. Uh, Fauzi, I would also like to say that absolutely. I mean, they, uh, there is actually a lot of funding available. I mean, you just look at the amount of money that we are pouring into uh, th th that same drip irrigation project that I talked about. Billions literally have been poured into with zero reserve. If those billions have been poured into a defense project, I'm sure they would have made something better out of it. So the resources are available. Uh, so that, so, so it, it's just that we need to put, put our heads together and sort of um, uh, go go about the way that we that we want to. The other thing that I wanted to say very quickly was that before we were starting and we were informally chatting amongst ourselves, we were all kind of um, I mean just just joking around. I I always say that I um, am always a, uh, an optimist. When I started to see these things ten years back, see me, nobody was talking about these technologies. Jo sari debate thi around dams, storages, and uh, a sort of downstream uh, ecological flows, it was completely different. Uh, the government departments that we went to uh, talk to, I mean, we have Mohsen Saab here, uh, who is talking about water productivity. 10 years back, nobody, nobody in the government was talking about water productivity sitting in the irrigation department. Irrigation department or agriculture department, there was no link. Nahi tha. Here, is an in, here is a multinational. I mean, aap jis bhi unko bura kahe, because they are funding a, a, a very pivotal technology to a university, which is in their value chain. I mean, 10 years back, who would have, uh, I mean, the brands like Nestle and Coke, I mean, you, you would associate very different things to it. So I am an optimist. I have seen a lot of change in these last 10 years in which we have moved in a good direction. It's just that time is running out for us very, very fast. This crisis is sort of coming, coming to us. Mohsen Saab was talking about 2025. Uh, Mohsen Saab, I think that time already has come to us. But, but, but uh, having said that, I mean, I hope the world is and I'm always an optimist. Dr. Bashir? <clears throat> uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I think I'm going to disagree with Abu Bakr. Uh, uh, it doesn't that the government department is listing and doesn't that the government is sitting If we have a drip or any adoption, we should compare it in Sonic and in other countries. It's like that. It's like And uh, uh, this is not a scary picture. Nahi hai. As I said that uh, there are now very good uh, uh, examples, success stories are he hai and been uh, and jointly milke sabko un uh, success stories ko uh, public uh, public karna hai ki logon ka trust isme build ho. Uh, uh, one thing I missed due to uh, 
माय इंटरनेट प्रॉब्लम दैट इज रीजनरेटिव एग्रीकल्चर जिस पे बहुत ज्यादा फोकस है और उस गवर्नमेंट डिपार्टमेंट पीआरसी एज वेल एज मेनी अदर डिपार्टमेंट इस पे फोकस कर रहे हैं और अडॉप्शन भी हो रही है दैट इज रेस बैट जो कंपेयर अगर कंपेयर करें ट्रेडिशनल बेसन इरिगेशन के साथ इन वेरियस कमोडिटीज आपका ट्वेंटी टू फोर्टी परसेंट वाटर सेविंग है एंड इफ अगर हम इसको लेके जाएं राइस और वेट के साथ तो इसके बेनिफिट्स बहुत ज्यादा होंगे आई एम हैप्पी कि हमने मिड दो हजार से रेस बेड पे काम शुरू किया था बट विद द स्लो प्रोग्रेस नो देज सक्सेस कह लें कि द फार्मर्स आर नॉट टर्निंग इन टू अडोप्टिंग दीज टेक्नोलॉजीज बट अब ज्यादा फोकस हम कर रहे हैं कि जो रेस बैट है दुनिया में भी प्रूव हो सकता हो चुका हुआ है कि इन टर्म्स ऑफ वो सीजनल नहीं होने चाहिए क्रॉस पे नहीं होने चाहिए दोज शुड बी परमानेंट रेस बैट एंड दोज वी हैव डिमॉन्स्ट्रेटेड इट सक्सेस और लेट्स होप जॉइन हैंड्स विद दीज टेक्नोलॉजी टेक्नोलॉजीज इसकी ऑप्शन पे काम किया जाए एंड फॉर दिस वन वी आर वर्किंग इन शेखुपुरा एट अ फार्मर्स फील्ड एंड ऑन ट्वेंटी सेवंथ वी आर होल्डिंग वन सेमिनार ओवर देयर एंड इनवाइटिंग वेरियस काइंड ऑफ पीपल एंड आई डू इनवाइट ऑल ऑफ मैं शेयर भी करूंगा इनवाइट और आप सबको इनवाइट करेंगे आए देखें और उधर जो रेस बैट एज वेल एज परमानेंट रेस बैट की सक्सेस को वी हैव प्रूवन दैट टेक्नोलॉजी टेक्नोलॉजी बट उसके लिए जो एसोसिएटेड टेक्नोलॉजी है जो मशीन है सोइंग मशीन है एंड हार्वेस्टिंग मशीन है वी नीड टू वर्क ऑन दैट वन सो दैट इज द मिसिंग लिंक एंड वी हैव टू जॉइंटली ओवरकम दिस इशू सो विद दैट थैंक यू वेरी मच Makar, any point, quick points from you? I think uh, uh, just a quick point. I think role of media is very important. Someone talk about the camera, but I think where we had a good success on uh, telling stories is we. Uh, so I think twenty was uh, taken off and twenty one as well because of COVID. But till nineteen, we had a lot of visit that we have taken to show media what we are doing on drip irrigation, on water conservation, special on the farming side, and that was really really successful. For instance, I give you an example that you know one day I received a call from um, uh, Mohsin Saab colleague, uh, looking after the livestock, and he just uh, he's a friend also, so he called me and said you know he just uh, read a story in Dawn on what Nestle is doing on drip irrigation and. so he wanted to uh, see that and then i mentioned him you know his uh, that you know we have a facility at juvas so he personally visited that facility and tried to understand and then push livestock department also you know if they can work with the farmers on drip irrigation uh, area as well so the you know the important part is you know the spreading the word and how is working for the farmers so probably that will one good story will replicate many so i think that's the only missing part i would see in the in the discussion otherwise i think uh, so that's very important for me communicating what we are doing and all together is is very very important correct uh, mohsin sir jisse maine kaha tha shuru mein it will be a great learning experience and it has been media ki jo bhi baat ho rahi hai na without the media being involved awareness nahi paida ho sakti jis waqt media kisi cheez ko leta hai bar bar usko jab wo प्रोजेक्ट करता है तो लोगों तक वो मैसेज पहुंचता है <coughs> ये जो ड्रिप इरिगेशन की हम बात कर रहे थे उसके मुकाबले में रेस बेड वुड बी वंडरफुल फॉर अस हमारे हमारे जो आईक्यू लेवल या हमारी जो एक्सपोजर है हमारे एक आम फार्मर की उसको ड्रिप इरिगेशन उसके लिए बहुत मुश्किल है और ड्रिप इरीगेशन का मैंने भी शौक किया कि इसको मैं करूँ यू नो हाउ मच इज इट गोन कॉस्ट मी पर एकड़ इट्स सेवेंटी थाउजेंड रुपीज पर एकड़ जब मुझे एक सौ रुपए का पानी मिल रहा है तो मैं सत्तर हजार रुपए क्यों इन्वेस्ट करूंगा उस पर मेरा रिटर्न तो देखिए आप पांच सौ सालों में जाके मुझे उसके पैसे पूरे होंगे सो दैट रियली इज एन अट्रैक्शन फॉर मी टू गो देर अच्छा दिस मीडिया थिंग इज अ वंडरफुल आइडिया एंड मेरे ख्याल में एक uh, ये uh, करना चाहिए पैमरा के साथ भी जिसके साथ भी आई ऑल्सो टॉक टू द पंजाब जो हमारा इंफॉर्मेशन डिपार्टमेंट है उनके साथ एंड रेडियो वुड बी द बेस्ट मीडियम बिकॉज देहात में लोग रेडियो सुनते हैं वो ट्रैक्टर चला रहा होगा पीछे रेडियो लगा होगा 
काश्तकार भाइयों का प्रोग्राम वट एवर वो भी जो भी उनके चल रहे होते हैं दे लिसन टू दैट मे बी लिटरेसी की थोड़ी सी हमारी जैसे रूरल एरियाज में कमी होगी मे बी प्रिंट मीडिया वो इश्तिहार कोई आएगा तो वो शायद वो कलर्ड इश्तिहार और वो अट्रैक्शन होगी बट समबडी रीडिंग एंड राइट अप ऑन दिस वो कम होगा तो हमें इसको विजुअल मीडियम के साथ इसको प्रोपोगेट करने की जरूरत है and i think that is something that is something that i've learned today see like i said we have to learn something in every meeting that we meet so i'm going to go work with the uh, information department and try to get them to make some kind of advertisement or koi uske par advertising campaign hi kare main to abhi idhar se khatam hote i'll call them up and maybe for this world water day they can come up with some kind of a, an advertisement in the newspapers they have this funding for them for uh, press ke liye so inshallah we'll do that thank you very much brilliant thank you so much and and like i said in the beginning it's it's always enlightening to see that you listen to us and then you're ready to take action soon after and thank you so much everyone for giving your time for uh, keeping up with the technical glitches and um starting late but also ending a little late and uh, a lot of people have given very nice comments and questions at uh, in the in our live webinar so if there are any particular questions that we weren't able to answer we'll uh, send them to the panelists and come back to you with the answers uh, the um i think wrap up a uh, comment from me would be that as a as a citizen we are so used to blaming um others that we you know very seldom do we look at ourselves and see our actions so i think alongside uh, blaming everyone every practice every technology um uh, perhaps it would be nice for all of us to just sit as an individual as an individual citizen as a farmer and see what are we doing wrong how are we valuing or not valuing water and how are we actually part of the problem if we look at the bigger scale of things because uh, like we say if it's just one person polluting then uh, 1 billion of us make 1 billion uh, pollution uh, level so so we we are all party to the pollution and that's how i like to look at it so uh, let us all come together and act individually as well as collectively and and make sure that our communities are uplifted and that our uh, ecosystem services are well taken care of and we take care of the pl planet as it deserves to be taken care of thank you so much for listening to us and take care thank you lagari sir you mess you sent the message i can see that thank you thank you everyone for joining take care bye it was really good thank you bye bye thank you very much thank you very much